and I'm joined by Mr. Greg Hart of Captain Space. How are you keeping, pal? No, I'm very good, Lee. Nice to see you again. Yeah, always on good. A to lovely talk. hot day. Yeah, it's been like you say, nice hot day. And uh, we yeah, have thanks for. The sun. We've kickstarted the sun. So you have indeed, mate. <laughs> it's magic. It's magic. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, thanks for your time again, mate. Always good to chat to you. Um, and like you say, you uh, you guys have officially released Kickstart the Sun. Uh, it was two weeks ago Friday, wasn't it, that that came out? Uh, so yeah, yeah, it'd be two weeks ago Friday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So longer, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bet it does with the amount of work that you guys put in, been been putting into it. But uh, over a year, yeah, it's like, oof, what was it, seventeen months now since wow. we started. So that's how long it takes, you know, to do the album, record it, get it ready, get it manufactured get messed about by the manufacturers about a zillion times and uh yeah you've got to be so far ahead it's a shame in a way because by the time your album comes out it, to us it feels like it's a year old you know but yeah unfortunately that's the nature of the beast of vinyl pressing at the minute so hopefully yeah. it will improve but i can't see it doing so anytime soon yeah i saw you saw the video of you and uh, steve the other day showing off the vinyl it looks like the yeah. vinyl looks really good now yeah there's just so much demand for it and there ain't the machines that's the trouble there's more and more people want more vinyl done but there aren't any more machines so you literally can't do the man hours to, yeah. to make more vinyl so it's a real problem i just hope they get it sorted and somebody makes a machine or can you know find one that's hidden somewhere because we hear all different stories about you know one turns up in indonesia one in malaysia one in blooming timbuktu you know when you know one of the pods of time we must have had 10 15 record plants in the uk they just got rid of all the machinery when it when it died you know now they're kicking themselves yeah now they're kicking themselves like you say there's that there is that demand back yeah. for vinyl these last few years i've been saying it i've been saying it since 2008 was the first time i thought there's going to be a problem here vinyl is going to come back and it's going to kick people in the ass and i was laughed at by a lot of people i said you watch it will come back because everything goes full circle and i'm not laughing now no no exactly like you say i mean that was one of the things i invested in during lockdown you know was um, i meant to do it for a while i had my dad's old vinyl player that he sort of bequeathed me if you like um, yeah. and yeah i invested in lockdown was a you know decent vinyl player and, and started collecting again properly so yeah yeah it's it's big, big stuff and it looks good as well it looks good it you know? yeah. goes back so, yeah. to having that you know that physical thing that a lot of us do one and Getting to see the album artwork properly and everything else so it's what it's designed for you know it's you know we're old school as we say time and time again but it does endear to the fans you know when they hear our kind of stuff and other bands stuff as well you know they want to they want the whole deal you know it's like buying a car with no tires on it you know the car looks great but you've got to put tires on it to make it work and i think our uh, our way of doing things it needs vinyl you know it needs to have that wow factor you know, so when people get it they go home they take it out and they go back to being 1977 or whatever it was again and and i think it endears them to the music more i think it almost creates another layer to the music where they're automatically excited about it even if the record's rubbish you know they're, they're, they're still excited by it and i think they'll make out as better than it probably was you know but touch wood people seem to think our stuff is rubbish but yeah it's, it's a whole package you know so yeah. it's good. I love it. I love it when our vinyls turn up eventually. <laughs> and we do it and um, it makes the whole process worthwhile. You know, that is the icing on the cake, you know, as much as the gigs in, in many ways. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, the, the, the artwork's fantastic, mate. I mean, was it Stevie? It's yeah. Stevie who gave up the artwork. It's Andy Kitson's artwork. He does all the master painting, if you like. Oh, and wow. Stevie, Stevie does all the digital stuff. So when you see all the cat pods and the t-shirt designs and bits and bobs like that that's all stevie's work but andy does the raw artworks um to be fair we, we don't tinker with it we obviously have to recolor them for printing and stuff <laughs> but no they're all proper old school artworks um so was that like an oil painting or like a, a acrylics. acrylics he does them on acrylics he kind of does them on oh what's his size he normally works on about 26 for 20 kind of size canvas boards um i've got the, the originals of um bootleg bandoleros and scarecrow here and they're just oh wow phenomenal oh yeah i mean we we i buy them off him don't get me wrong <laughs> you know that's the deal yeah he charges me but 
is a proper old school artist and it all goes hand in hand you know everything we do has a purpose yeah. the digital stuff is really good though because stevie is an absolute wizard is you know the cat helmets the, the three pods that you did for this album are just another level up from the last album because we're always reinventing what the story is so yeah. it's gone from an ice pod through to an aqua pod and now it's into the you know like the fire pods and mm. going up to the, the sun and stuff and it's just superb but you know we we love it so much you know we're one step away from a Hanna Barbera cartoon you know that's <laughs> that's where our kind of work ethic is you know so it's it's, it's great the whole just the whole vibe of Cats in Space and all what we bring to it it's a whole package you know from HR Puff and stuff onwards so it's, yeah. it's cool you know I mean you do loads of artwork yourself mate so do you feel like yeah. that sort of appeases to that side of your creativity as well <laughs> yeah I mean I just haven't got time to do that you know I mean no. you know I've been asked whether I'll do any paintings of the band and stuff like that and yeah I could but you know there's a there's a limit to how much I want to put the face to the project in a way because you know I write the songs in the main you know mm. nowadays um you know I, I have a lot to say about it or I'm the kind of spokesperson for the banks I've got the biggest gob you know and all this kind of stuff if I start doing all the artworks as well I'm gonna be like that Dennis Waterman character on Little Britain you know right that <laughs> <laughs> little diddy character kind of you know hidden away but I'd, and yeah so and Andy Kitson's you know he's, he's different gravy his style of painting is absolutely magnificent so I'd never I'd never get involved in that I'm more of a kind of pop art type guy um and that's kind of where my kind of skill is if you like so maybe one day i'll paint the band in a pop art style i don't know we'll, we'll see when, when we've got a year off maybe <laughs> doesn't sound like, i was gonna say it doesn't sound like you guys give yourself much time off to be fair mate there's no time off mate this is 24 7 this is what i was saying to someone in an interview the other day i said if you want to do this game in this day and age properly you've got to devote yourself to it. Um, that's the cat <laughs> knocking a very expensive bowl nearly off the table i would show you to him but it'll do phone or forth. but um, yeah you've got you've got to do this thing full time because otherwise you just miss loads of tricks you know if you haven't got a manager and a team of people that are employed full time to do cats in space we have to do it it's as simple as that and we had this conversation yesterday in actual fact where a manager nowadays really has to wear so many hats Mm. even he could do the amount of stuff that cats in space would need you know book the gigs do this do that you know make sure the tour runs well get the album sorted get you know everything has to work to a timeline and at my ripe old age along with stevie and the other guys we just said if you want something doing do it yourself because yeah. that way you know it will get done it'll be done how you want it yes it's a lot more work but ultimately, there's less mistakes made you know so it is a full-time job and if somebody wants to get into this game as it is now and do what we're doing you better have an awful lot of time put aside for it or you'll just touch the surface and unless you're incredibly lucky you'll be back down digging holes on the monday you know weekend warriors kind of thing you know like you say you you're saying you got a lot, of, lot to say about the album but a lot of people got a lot to say about the album mate the reviews are coming in thick and fast i've seen a lot of great reviews already which is brilliant um, yeah, they are. They're phenomenal reviews. I mean, <laughs> I keep saying, it's like I've written them myself and dished them out to people to put into their magazines. You know? they are, <laughs> they're astonishing in places. I mean, they're really quite overwhelming. You know, it's, um, I say it every time. I said it on Atlantis. I said it on Narnia. Uh, you know, I say it all the time. You never can take for granted that the people are going to love your next record in fact it's normally the opposite they're waiting for the car crash they're waiting for the the oh and here it comes here comes the the bad album you know so there's always a nerve-wracking kind of thing going on with us but i had a kind of hunch that when this album was done i thought well if this doesn't really light people's fires then i think you're going to get after this one you know we'll just call it that's our final swan song yeah but the response has been absolutely <laughs> crazy and it is seeping overseas now which is good it's about bloody that's time good. yeah that's really so, good yeah it's good i like said like the response has been really good the reviews have been great obviously you already got to 
So number one in the album metal rock chart thing you hit last week for with it. Which yeah, great. number one. And we're at the five in the indie. We're at number, oh, I don't know what it was. Is it 11 in the physical sales as well, which is for national. That's brilliant. I mean, that's a, I remember seeing the picture last week when it was sent through to me. And it's like Dark Side of the Moon, Jeff Rhodes Hole, Thick as a Brick. You know, and then there's Cats in Space. I mean, sitting there below Dark Side of the Moon, it's like for one week only, that looks pretty good. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I don't but think you can complain at that. But it goes to show also that we've had to do a lot of pre-sales and a lot of push to get our album into that position. Yet Dark Side of the Moon just keeps doing it, you know, because they're all sales for one week only. Yeah. You know, so it goes to show no matter how hard we work, Dark Side of the Moon, We'll just sell that many copies regardless. It's like buying a packet of fags, isn't it? Oh, and the dark side of it. <laughs> that's yeah, crazy, isn't it? Think that you know, yeah. 40 plus years later, that's still selling that many copies. But... Old rock rules, mate. I mean, I think yeah. that's the way, and I love it. I love it when I see Queen's Greatest Hits being the biggest selling album of all yeah. time in the UK. What does that tell us? That that shit is still the best. Yeah. It's and nothing's coming along that makes you think, oh, actually, this is better. It's not. You can't be the tried and tested classic rock, which is what we try and do. So we're, we're happy, you know, when we see things like that, we're just riding in there in our own little way, you know. Yeah, but man. Well, like you're saying, was there any sort of difference in your approach between Atlantis and Kickstart the Sun then? Or were you just going it with, did you go with a not different really. in mind or anything other than obviously making it a double vinyl? No, it was a bit of a, a bit of a weird one because I can't really remember the. I got in, I kind of got involved after the Atlantis album come out, and we knew there was lockdown, all that old nonsense was still going on. I, the main thing that we had to work out is because we worked so far ahead. I just put a tentative call into our agent that does the manufacturer manufacturing for vinyl. I said it's a bun fight out there. I know. And the lead times have shifted from 12 to 16 weeks to three months to four months to six. I said, what am I looking at in all realistic, you know, kind of potential for the next album? Because, you know, we have to look already to the next album, even though Atlantis has only been out two months. Yeah. I'm thinking, well, I'm, I know it's going to take a year to do it. So there's a year gone. Now you've got to think if there's eight months manufacturing time, that's 18 months. Mm. I need to be on it. So he said, uh, yes, that's exactly what it will be. He said, if I, I'd recommend you get the next album ready. If you want it by an autumn release 2022, you need to have it with us by January of 2022. So this is now January of 2021, yeah? And I'm thinking, right, I know how this works now. All this year will take me to do the next album. And I've literally not even turned the phages down from Atlantis. I'm like, Christ. Wow. So that worried me that I had a few sleepless nights over that. And then I slowly started to get my head around a few things. There was a few ideas that were, weren't used for Atlantis because you know, I'm always writing some songs go completely one hit, some stick around for a while, some have to be pulled in from different sources, whatever. Yeah. So I pulled all my bits and pieces off the phone and I thought, oh, actually, no, there's some good bits here that I never got ready for Atlantis. So I thought, I'm just going to have to get on with it. So in February of last year, me and Ian Capel had the conversation and said, we've got to do Atlantic, uh, the new album already. And he went, great, let's get on with it. So we did. But I said, this time I'm going to write 16 or 15 songs and have some B-sides just for a bit of extra kind of yeah. chunk to put out there with singles and whatnot. And I put myself up to a ridiculously hard task to do that. But then it went into this kind of foggy kind of two months where yeah. I was writing and I can't remember what happened. So I just go into one. I literally go yeah. into like another world and I'm not very good company and I'm at hell to live with. And I'm, you know, everyone goes, oh, no, he's, this is it. This is it's going to push him over the cliff here. And I just go into my own little world, walk in the woods, go down the park, go for a run. And somewhere this shit's in the back of my head and it just starts to come to the front. I think it's 30 years worth of material, to be fair. Uh, I've always had in my head sub in the subconscious yeah and I just put them down thinking oh, I need one of them I need one of them oh that's a good title oh, that's a good thing Stevie put some words to me I go to him for words Damien came up with some ideas I gave him some rough piano sketches and he came back with these incredible melodies including obviously the title track Kickstart the Sun 
Nice. Before we know it, I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be good, this. And um, it was okay. Um, and then King of Stars and Bootleg Bandoleros, the two massive tracks on the album, <laughs> as well as Kickstart the Sun, they were all out in one go with me trying to make them work. That was that was nervous breakdown time, that was, because I thought, I've got to make these work. It took me months to do that. I was still doing bootlegs at least until June last year. Oh, wow. That's that probably, I was working on that for at least two months as a song. Then it took weeks to record and weeks to mix. Um, Kickstart fell into shape quite nicely. And King of Jigsaw, that was... And I kept going, another bit, another bit, another bit. But it, it was good. It was good fun. It was the most ambitious album that we're ever likely to do, to be fair. With what you say there about King of Stars, was it just was it just what building up the layers that was the nightmare, or was it getting the song how you wanted it in your head down onto the yeah, paper as it were? It's, it's the thing is it's really easy. It's it's hard to explain the songwriting process, really, but I find it hard because it just happens for me. It just it just works, you know, something just comes out. But because I can write quite quick mm. at times, there's always that dubious element of, I've written that too quick, it must be rubbish. And then you take it into the studio, which then you, the meter's running and the clock's running and the, yeah. and the money's kind of thinking, this is going to cost, I think, is that going to be worth the money we're spending on it? Am I going to junk that halfway through? But they just seem to work. And I, I, if I analyse it too much, I'll probably dry up. So I kind of tend to just think, I know I can do it and I'll just keep doing it. And as a producer, you know, you always work to your best elements and you always let whatever it needs to make the song work, you make that happen, you know? So Damien was great at coming back with these little ideas on, on his recorder. I thought, oh, wow, and I just knew where Kickstarter the Sun was gonna go from that point. And um, that, 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 that's how it kind of works. And he's also very, very quick vocalist I mean he's incredibly quick in the studio the quickest singer I've ever worked with by boat ride you know it's almost like he wants to get home again but he's okay, just... I remember you uh, saying me in certain songs on Atlantis he didn't like one take yeah seasons change was one yeah. take I mean th there's no more than three takes on any track on this new album wow that's he, he gives us minimal takes but you don't need it we don't need to stack up hundreds of vocals and piece together a good one and even if we do piece one together He'll go home. I'll say, oh, mate, that was gold today. He'll go, yeah, I could probably shoot that in one hit now, though. Now I know that's what you want. And he'll come back and he'll re-sing it in four minutes. And I went, what? <laughs> you know, within the hour, he's double tracking and putting the harmonies on the chorus and I'm up on the mic doing harmonies or whatever. Yeah. It's just like mental, but it's, it's just a joy. So we're, Damien has given us this kind of no limits approach to what we do so whenever i think about what we're going to do next nothing phases us you know jeff brown incredible bass player can play anything we need him to play and he's a great singer and he really has a good feel for the song his bass playing is criminally underrated by you know over the years he's known as the singer from the suite he's a bloody good bass player he's john deacon and he's pete um sorry john Entwistle. you know oh yeah you know, he's, I'm a bass player myself, so anytime I come see you guys, you'll find me just like, watching watching him. Oh, he's he's very watchable, is that, Jeff? He's very watchable. Yeah, <laughs> D D Dean is a tasty guitar player. D Dean, yeah. no bother with Dean. He, we, we always play together so well, you know, and it's, I know what he's going to do. You know, we just say, oh, that'd be Dean that will. Yeah. You know, Dean will do that. We just know what he'll do, you know. Stevie, phenomenal, meticulous drummer that will just analyze the songs till the cows come home and just give you the ultimate performance you know andy stewart will just well he's just a whiz on the piano sitting behind a grand piano and you might as well have elton john there you know it's so we're we're a, a good bunch you know and i'm very fortunate to be able to use them to our best advantage yeah some of the case parts on this once again andy andy's playing does really remind me of elton john in a lot of areas and a lot of songs oh get, yeah the piano we have this little thing saying a bit of Elton on that one or a bit of, you know, a bit of this, a bit of that. And and I kind of play piano at home and I'm writing the songs and I, in my head, I'm just playing Tiny Dancer 10 times <laughs> yeah. at a time, you know. And, but it works. I've known Andy 40 years. We've been together for a very long time. I, I don't need to think about it. I just know he's going to do the Bobby Crush bit, you know, <laughs> and all that. Yeah. We, we have a telepathic kind of energy between us and it's, 
it's just the joy. You know, when you can go into the studio, there's this confidence thinking, we're just going to make an album that is going to, if it's not going to sell like Queen, it's going to pretty well sound like one in places because I won't stop until it does. And I think we've, we're getting there, you know. I think the production and the engineering for me and Capel, we just say from day one, this album, whatever happens, it has to be sonically as good as those albums from the 70s. So yeah. and I don't care we get there. I'm not going to stop to get there. It's not about that will do or well, that's what we're left with or, well, that's what it is really. No, that doesn't come into our world it's like mm. is that piano how we want it to be is that how it is is that as big as we need it to be and we don't stop till it is and it's 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 a bloody hard task that's why we take nine months to do an album but it's hopefully it shows in the grooves you know well i think you don't get wrong there's a lot of stuff that i like that's also you know on the rural side of things and and you can knock that stuff together but obviously with stuff like yourself when we have got, um, you know, that, the rock and the layers and the, and the vocal harmonies and everything else that goes into it, to the style of music that you guys do. Um, I think you got to put the effort in, you got to put it, you know, it's not a punk album at the end of the day, you can't knock it together in a couple of weeks. Um, Absolutely, no, you got you got to put the time in and you got to have the skill to do it, dare I say, because, um, mm. you know, we've learned well, because we've got Mick Wilson, who is the vocal machine, you know, and I've been with Mick for six, seven years now. And, it, you know, although he always says, I sit behind him in the phone, promoting the band while he's doing all the graft, you know, <laughs> it's a bit of a joke really, but, you know, I'm, I'm learning how he sings, I'm learning how he does stuff and how exact he is. And I, from my vocal point of view, I've improved tenfold, you know, with my limited voice that I've got, but I've improved tenfold with Mick because he gave me the confidence to really go, go for it and not shy away from just trying to be a, you know, an average singer, you know, so he's given me a lot of confidence as well. And two with Damien, you know, yeah. I mean, Jeff, you know, it's a formidable force when you've got that skill going on. You would have to raise your own game as well. Definitely. I mean, one of the things, I mean, I had the album on the car the other day and my wife, was with, Joe, was with us in the car. And, um, you know, we were talking about the album stuff and, and Joe said, you know, the one thing that always impresses her on the on your albums is the vocal harmonies. You know, as Joe put it, not since sort of like ELO or Queen, there's, there's not a band that's got those harmonies and those voices that all work as united front i mean yeah you've got damien out front like you say but you know all the harmonies in the back end also obviously add that texture and those layers and thick oh, yeah. that sound and it just yeah. sounds incredible man yeah well, well thanks yeah i mean from day one cats in space was always going to be a big harmony band you know i wanted the the huge queen 10 cc mm. style vocals dare i say you know a bit of your eye heap in there as well if you will you know it's um when we knew how good we could do them, and of course, you know, I've heard mixed stuff that he's done on his own. I'm like, we could go anywhere we want with these vocals. So we just had fun and we just made them so ridiculously big. You know, then there's the layers, there's the counter melodies, there's the doo wops and doop doop doops going on in the verses, and we put everything into it. But you you have got to be good to do it. And I'm not blowing our trumpet, but you do have to be very, very pinpoint exact because some of those vocals are actually percussive. Yeah. So you have to smash them on the one, you've got to cut them off at the right time, you've got to do your breath at the right time, and it takes time to do it. But when you've got people like Mick and Damien and Jeff and dare I say myself doing it, we're just dialed in and we're very, very accurate. You know, there's harmonies on our albums where you think it's someone, but it's actually someone else. Because I can sing higher than, well, no, actually Damien can sing higher than me. <laughs> he's got he's got another rung on that one but i can sing really really high and some people don't always see that you know and, and jeff sings really strong lead vocal third and fifths you know and mick does these lovely textures and the you know the four voices together is massive absolutely massive so and we work them as well so when we do it live we've got the best of the amount that we do because we can't do 120 vocals live obviously you know, no, of course. Not, yeah, you know but there are literally stacks of them, stacks and stacks of vocals on our album. You know, it's insane. You know, Ian Capel, I don't know how he does what he does, because when we're chucking out these backing vocals and they're coming up on the screen, yeah, he's got so many to, to get into groups and stuff like that and make them right and then give them the right kind of vibe. And it's just, it's just brilliant fun. You, know? you were saying earlier that, um, you know, um, the stars was like your, you know, the one one of the ones that was like a pain for you. Was there any particular song that was the opposite of that that came together really quickly, really easily, 
or uh, they were um, sort of yeah uh teenage millionaires is a quick one because that's just my sweet influence coming out there yeah. although for some bizarre reason as i was doing that and i've got no idea why but there's something in that song that reminds me of lover boy that kind right. of band, Lover of canada i've got no idea why but there's just this something about the chords in a certain part i'm thinking that sounds a bit like lover boy but anyway but that one came together really quickly and Stevie had the lyrics and again one of these weird things where he sent me some words I went they just fit perfectly over this idea I've got absolutely so that song came quick and uh, Charlie's ego came pretty quick because when I do the quirky stuff and I've got this like a weird lyrical bent you know story that I want to tell I tend to do it really quickly like I'm down the pub talking about it to someone oh yeah and then what I do is I'll just literally talk for, t for far too long, probably. And um, I find that I can get the song out really quickly. And I'm not precious about how the words are, whether there's maybe a better thing. But all of that, you know, like a faded neon sign and, you know, the, the magpies flying close to the ditch and you know, yeah. cackle of witches. It comes quick to me. That's my Hanna-Barbera head going on there, you know. Mm. Um, so those two were, were quick. The others, not so. Um, 51 Pillow Beds was actually a different song to start with. And then I got this idea for the music and the words seemed to fit there. But that that took some time. Um, although it's quite a simple song, I needed to get the right vibe because the chord structure is quite similar in the verse and chorus. Right. Um, uh, Last Dance Saloon, me and Mick did quite a while ago. That is one of the one songs we managed to write together because we've been very busy in recent years and with covid we just had no chance to get together but that one was one that we started a while ago so i kind of finished that off but yeah no they, they kind of you know they take time in the main so um you mentioned that the tour there right? that's kicking off next month um starting yep. next month and well into december um yeah september 29 yeah so i mean i'll be coming down to the cambridge one so i'll see you guys there um but what as, as well as seeing you guys like what well, i'm always excited by it. every time i see you you always have a really cool support band i've never seen you not have a good support act and no, was... well you got you got to have good support bands otherwise it's you know it's pointless you know we got matt mitchell who's a good yeah. mate of mine. Oh, i met on the show a couple of months ago he's great yeah guy. he's absolutely brilliant and and the thing is we, we felt really bad for matt because when we toured with him last time because oh, yeah. normally you try and you know use different supports or guests you know mm. but matt got a real bum steer on a couple of our shows through problems we had technical problems with the pa not our fault just yeah. and he got a real bum steer on two of the gigs and i felt for the guy he was absolutely run ragged to try and get on stage in time to the point where he had to cut his set short and i just thought you know what it's, it's, that's not right that's really crap so I said, I'll make amends to that. So when he said, um, have you got a support for your tour yet? I said, well, we're talking to a few bands. There's a few people out there. One one that we was going to use, unfortunately, couldn't do all the dates. So we had to let them go. And he went, well, I've got a new album coming out on July 29th. I went, same day as ours. I went, no, you're in. <laughs> you're in. That's, that's meant to be. So, yeah, we've got good old Matty with us. And he's, he's going to be brilliant. Yeah. yeah, his new album, Mission, is brilliant. Fantastic. Really he's just yeah, he's a, he's a good lad, and our fans liked him before. So we had Vambo as well, who uh, said yeah, that, was a, that was the first time I saw Vambo was when I saw you guys in Norwich at Epic last year. Yeah. I think it was. They're brilliant, man. That band. That, that band, that um, Pete, the guitar player, he's far too good, so I'm going to drop his hands off one day. <laughs> and and um, yeah, um, and I mean, what a singer. Jeez. Oh, Jack. What a voice on Jack. Jack. Jack is brilliant. And they're just lovely guys. In fact, I've, I went around their house a few months ago to um, have a drink. I managed to, to talk to Ray all night about muds because I'm, I'm a huge mud fan. So me and Ray just now. But he said, do you want to hear some new tracks that the guys are doing? And I went, oh, yeah, cool. And they put three or four new tracks on. I'll tell you what. Watch out, people. They've got a sound now. They've got a sound that is quite i can't describe it really but i'm not going to name any bands it sounds like but they've got a sound on these new songs and it's superb so yeah watch out for vambo they're gonna they're gonna kick up guarantee it i must admit i'm really looking forward to hearing the, the new album there was one of those ones when 
and I saw them with you in Norwich. I hadn't heard them before. I heard the name flowing about, but I hadn't heard them myself. And, uh, yeah. you know, they came on and it was one of those ones where it was like, you know, good few forward steps got taken during their set and oh, now I'm liking this. And then I went yeah, straight yeah. between, you know, them finishing you guys coming on, which straight over the merch stop. Had a chat with Jack, bought the, bought the, bought the first album and it's... Um, yeah, no, this one's a step up, mate, definitely. Yeah. It's, it's oh, really I look forward to hearing that then, mate. Yeah, they're, they're, they are really good and they're, and they're really good lads as well and very respectful. They're very cool and they're just just a great band. I'm really rooting for them. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I'll get more involved with them, I think, as time goes on because they've got serious potential, serious <laughs> potential. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sticking around them. <laughs> <'Cause> they're, <laughs> They're just great guys, you know. They're just really great guys, and and you know they were super respectful doing the dates with us. You yeah. know, they they weren't like trying to be all cocky and yeah, yeah, yeah. these old geezers we're playing with. Yeah. Polar opposite. And Ray, you know, said to me, said, "You watch Cats in Space every night. Watch their whole set, and you learn. You learn from these guys that have been around the block. They know what they're doing." watch and learn and they watched every single gig they knew our songs better than we did by the end you know? <laughs> so it's really cool really cool yeah, it was nice like when i because i saw some supporting you and then earlier this year i went to a planet rock winter's end festival and they were playing that and sort of dragged a few people along there's a couple of people going oh, i don't know who these are i'm gonna go get beer i'm gonna go get something to eat whatever i was like no seriously stay for these guys trust me and you can yeah. see a lot of people getting sort of turned on and turned on to them as the as their set went on, when there were people going, you know, pricking their ears up. So yeah, I think the think people are going to start to take notice. Yeah, they've got a direction now that I think if they if they get that direction the way it should be, which I think they will do, they're going to smash it. Yeah, they're going to have a really good vibe going on. So um, yeah, and Jack's vocals on this new stuff that I've heard is, you know, he's he's up there. He's he's up there seriously. Yeah. Oh, I'm looking forward to hearing that then, mate. Yeah. He's, so, uh, he's like, He's like Damien. <laughs> These guys are not human. No, there's certain people out there that, that you get good singers and you, you get people that are just, like you say, they're not human. They're a, a couple of steps yeah. above some people. They're saying about, good singers got something about them that you can't describe. They've just got it. You know, and Dam Damien's got it in spades. Oh, know? God, yeah. Yeah. You know, like, you know, when obviously Damien joined the fold, it was that thing, you know, you guys have got a new singer and I wasn't sure. Hadn't heard Damon's vocals at that point, and then I remember you um, released the first track with him, and I was like, "Wow, this guy's good." And then, then seeing you live and seeing that even live, it's on a completely other level with Damien. And you know, oh, yeah, even Ned does the same thing twice. You know, we never quite know what he's going to do at each gig because he, he's a great person for ad libbing. So although he will sing the song as it needs to be sung, when there's the bits in the middle and all the little yelps and hollers and screams, yeah. you don't know what he's going to do. That's why you'll never get two gigs the same. So he's value for money as well. So uh, you have yeah. to come for every single one of our tour dates so you get the full package because it won't be the same twice. <laughs> <laughs> well, you say that. I was so, I was just looking at dates actually because you also play Milton Keynes like a couple months later, which isn't that far from me. So I thought about going Stable. to that as well as Cambridge. So. Well, there's the Stables gig, which is in December. Yeah. That, that's, that's the phenomenal venue. I mean, that is my favourite gig in the country, full stop. I love it there. We all love it there. It's a unique venue for musicians, you know, run by people that know how to do it. Mm. And it's just got a vibe about it that is so, so special. Um, so that gig in December is going to be phenomenal. But also, it's likely, I'm not going to say 100%, but it's going to possibly be a test for what we're going to do next year because we are moving to theatres next year. Um, we're going to do Kickstart the Sun Part 2, which, because we've never really, due to COVID and a few other bad things that happened to us along the way, yeah. we ne we've never really managed to tour one album completely. Awesome. Scarecrow, Scarecrow was great, but we had a bit of a weird thing went on in 2018 where we didn't tour it again. Hmm. Um, and I was in the studio doing Narnia at that point. Narnia, Paul Manzi left halfway through. Yeah. Um, then we, then Christmas came. Then we did Atlantis without any plan to play live because of COVID. We eventually managed to do only one half of the Atlantis tour because that Christmas lockdown was being thrown. Oh, right, all, yeah. all the tickets were getting refunded left, right and centre, which balls it. 
So I think we've never really had a good chance to milk an album how it should be. So kickstart, we will be going out again next year, hopefully with other stuff going on as well with it, but we're going to take it into theatres. We're going to do a full theatre show. Oh, nice. Which is going to be a two hour show. Um, and we're actually booking the dates as we speak that far in advance because you have to. Yeah, you know. um, and we are going to do things another way. You know, as always, we do things our way. Yeah. And we've come to realize that um, how Cats in Space are perceived, which is a theatre band. Some people say theatre band, jazz hands, you know, as a, like a bit of a, a, a put down. Yeah. But they're, but they're wrong, of course. Of course. Um, we are, you know, we are tailor made for theatres because our show needs to be big and it needs to be in that environment. So we're going to go for it. And it's going to be the biggest gamble that we've ever done, ever. And if it doesn't work, then I'll see it down the dole queue. But <laughs> um, I think it will work. And I think it will be the future for what we're doing. Um, and we will be able to finally give the fans a little bit more what I think they want from us. Because, you know, from day one, they've always wanted us to be ELO that brings down a spaceship with dry ice and, yeah. you know, all these like things going off. So, yeah, that's Cats Space. And trust me, we can see us doing that at the O2. You know, we've, we've got the the chops and the songs to put on something like that. But we haven't got millions of pounds and millions of followers that will pay for the tickets. But we can try and knock things up into a, a much better presentation that we can't do in the smaller rock clubs unfortunately much as we like playing the places yeah of course we're on top of each other you know you, and you can't see stevie on the drums and the and he's not even being lit properly because there's no lights on him you know we've done all that so we're going to make it into a much smoother nicer production and hopefully people go I'm going to spend money coming to see that. It's going to be great. It's going, trust me, it's going to be absolutely phenomenal. So oh. that's the plan for next year. Oh, nice one, man. I look forward to seeing what you're doing with that because anytime I've seen you guys, you know, we've always put on a great show, but to have that theatre aspect behind it as well and a more a visual representation, if you I like. I think so. I right. think we need to. Yeah, and we've got we've got um, a guy now, James, who does our videos. Oh, um, right. You know, he, he was involved um, years ago in, in the back screen projection business when it was in its infancy and he kind of put together all this kind of stuff with his company that started doing like x factor and all these big gigs and the, you know strictly come dancing or whatever you know they were one of the innovators of that stuff so he comes from that background you see so we we had a meeting yesterday funny enough and we said um when we do this thing next year what can you bring to the table when he's already got these wacky ideas of how to put on a production oh, for us so like i said it's going to be a big risk and it's going to be a, a big gamble but you know fortune favors the brave as i say it certainly does mate you know yeah. sometimes you just got to go for these things you know we haven't got time not to you know what i mean Lee? We, you know we, if we had 10 years to keep building and building in the clubs then we'd probably stick to doing that but we're not we're getting old you know if we don't go hell for leather now and and go for the bigger then you know, that's it. You know, we might as well give up. So you've got to go for it, you know. You do, mate. And like you say, you know, people are, are being taught or asking or, you know, because your music suits that more sort of theatre aspect. You know, people are going yeah. to want it anyway. So, yeah, why not go for it? I Definitely. Think and I think it will work, you know. And, I mean, the, the whole reason why I've, I talk about this is because I've done theatres with the Supersonic 70s show for over a decade now. Yeah. And we've noticed when we first started in 2010, 2011, all the theatre shows were the Roy Orbison story, Dolly Parton, Magic of Motown, blah, blah, blah. You know, all these kind of old 60s, you know, type old shows. But the audience has moved on a decade now. So the music's moved on a decade and the 60s isn't quite so big because unfortunately people are pegging it, you know. Mm. And we've noticed that more and more shows are now doing like, you know, Bon Jovi, you yeah. know, classic rock, you know, power ballads and the meatloaf story that that's all coming into theaters now because it's finding its home because that's the next level that's yeah. the new rock and roll if you like you know i'm thinking that's where we're going to end up because it seems to be a natural progression that as audience get older we're now the next oldest group if you like and we love thin lizzie and queen and yeah. kiss yeah. and all that stuff so that's the kind of stuff that we will go to the theater to see why not see an original band that sound like it 
So amongst all these tribute posters that clog up the world and get on my nerves, yeah. in the middle, Cats in Space, they'll go, oh, Cats in Space, that looks like an interesting theatre production. No wonder what that's all about. Oh, that's an original band. And we had this in the few theatres that we've done so far, where you attract a theatre audience that will be prepared to come and give you a go. Yeah. Based don't, on, get many, right. don't get many rock fans nowadays that will go into a sticky rock club and give a new band a go, like we did in the 70s and 80s. They tend not to do it now because kids haven't got that kind of mentality. Whereas if you go into a theatre and they've got a hardcore theatre fan base that buy the, you know, they get the brochure and buy the tickets, yeah. they will give new shows a go and they'll give an original show a go. You know, And those people might like Status Quo and Deep Purple, who we toured with, they go, oh, we'll go and see them, but they won't come down to the blah, blah rock club and see us because yeah. they'll be too frightened of getting stabbed and it won't be on till 10 o'clock at night. You know, <laughs> We're at the age where we want it a little bit more comfortable. So I think my, my, my idea is that that will work. So let's hope so. I hope so, mate. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what, what comes of that next year, man. It'll be really interesting to see how that gets put together. Like I said, if it doesn't work, I'll see it down the dole queue. But, you know, <laughs> we're, we're, we're busting our nuts on it. And I, and I think it'll be a grower. It's not going to be a, you know, if it is an overnight success, fantastic. But it's something that you can, you can build. Because if you can build in a 500 capacity theatre, yeah. it's much easier to build it there than to try and build it anywhere else. Because I've done this for 10 years of Supersonic 70s. We've built it to the yeah. point where where we had 110 people in the first gig, we now put 450 in. Yeah. And it's more lucrative, you can afford to do it. You can, you know, you can use that money wisely and it's a much better business model. So I'm hoping this is going to be a start of a, a, a new era of, of touring, you know. Well, I was going to ask you what the ne next year, um, you know, holds for you, mate, but we've kind of touched upon that anyway. I've done it. <laughs> Ask it. me another question. <laughs> <laughs> what size shoes am I? <laughs> I'm nine. Yeah, but yeah, no, it's, yeah. I know it's great, man. Uh, I guess anything's left to ask, mate. Um, you know, thanks for your time, everything, Greg. Always great to chat That's to you. Right. Pleasure. At the beginning of the interview, I'm going to play "Smoke and Mirrors" because it's probably one of my favourites off the album. Oh, good. That's a good call. Yeah. Um, but what song of the album would you like us to play at the end? <laughs> I mean, I'm going to go for the usual two, Kickstart the Sun or Bootleg Bandoleros. Put that on, you can go for a piss, can't you? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Radio 2 epic song, isn't it? Yeah, we're going to play yeah. um, Meatloaf, Bat Out of Hell now, and they'll bugger off out for fat. You know? <laughs> but I think, I think Kickstart the Sun I would ebb towards purely because of the astonishing vocals in that song. Yeah, great. You know, at the beginning by Damien and then the, everybody in the middle ending and the ending of the song, it's, yeah, it's, I can still play that song now after hearing it a billion times and I sit there and go, wow, we actually did that. It ticked all the boxes. One of the few songs that's ticked every box that I hope for when, you know, we're recording it because it's just mega, you know. All right, man, we'll go with that. <laughs> I think we should, Lee. I think we should, yeah. And uh, yeah, good luck with your gigs as well, mate. And we'll, yeah, cheers, uh, mate. hopefully catch you in Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. Like I say, I'll be down. So hopefully we'll we'll catch you to say hello, sort of thing. Definitely, definitely, mate. Looking forward to it. So yeah, to, uh, September twenty nine, the tour starts. Yeah, and then it goes through till December seventeenth uh, you know, or nineteenth. Is it? Who's it? Is it the seventeenth or the nineteenth that they finish? I, I, don't, I don't know. I've been the, the professional that I'm not. I don't know what the last date is. The last, no, the last date is um, the garage in London. All right, yeah. The night after Milton Keynes. And I think it's the 18th of December, is it? Just having a quick look now. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. And also, we've got, we got this great gig down at the Patty Pavilion in Swansea, um, which has been cut off three times because of COVID, which is a real shame. And that's going to be a Christmas bonanza. I think Vanbo are with us that night. Actually. Oh, nice. Um, and that is already selling really well. Apparently, I'm, I was told the other week that they've shifted a few tickets for that because we've got a great following in Wales. For some reason, I think the Welsh people think we're Welsh, but um, <laughs> but well, we are, yes, we're Welsh. But th that's going to be a great night. So those three dates in December are going to be absolutely phenomenal way of ending the year, which hopefully will set us up nicely for next year. Sounds great, man. Yeah, man. All right.
Thanks for your cool. time as always, Greg. Cheers, dude. No worries, Lee. Take care, mate. I'll see you again. Right.